So we're just going to go through the AUA guidelines for BPH and just kind of give you the historical context for why each guideline is there. Admittedly, there's, as we talked about yesterday, there's hundreds of procedures now we can do for BPH. Um, and, and so we're not going to, you know, the goal here is really to just give you some context for the AUA and why they think about different procedures in different ways. So it's not going to be an exhaustive um, discussion by any means, but hopefully just give you a flavor for the options that the AUA guidelines are based on. So by way of disclosures, these are the procedures that I personally perform. Uh, I do not perform HOLIP. Uh, I do not perform aquablation, although we are trying to um, acquire that at our hospital. Um, I do not perform the, the ITIN. So again, we'll do a quick, um, we'll review the AOA guidelines, we'll look at some of the data behind those guidelines, and then at the end I'll give you just my personal algorithm for how I think about uh, treatment options based on the patient presentation. And the take-home point is, this is not meant to be prescriptive. Uh, there's usually more than one right answer. So on the spectrum of therapy, we hinted at this yesterday, but this list gets longer and longer each time I give this talk. But, you know, over on the left, we have some of the um, less invasive options, Optolume, Urolift, Resume, ITIN. I would argue maybe Optolume and ITIN would be even further to the left because they, they are fairly, even more, you know, minimally invasive. PAE is probably on there. Um, and then, you know, as you progress, you get the more surgical interventions, the TURP, the TUIP, the laser therapies, and ultimately a simple prostatectomy. And so on the spectrum, we go from ease of use, minimal morbidity, preservation of a sexual function, over to procedures that might have more durable results or more definitive, but increased morbidity. So this is the updated AOA guideline from 2023. Um, it looks probably very similar to all the past iterations. I think a couple takeaways to note is finally um, TUNA and TUMT have been eliminated from this guideline. Uh, they used to be kind of dragging along in the back as an option, and this time they finally, you know, based on the risk-benefit analysis, they've removed it. Ultimately, I think the takeaway, though, is how you think about what procedure to offer still depends on size. Do you have a small prostate, a medium prostate? or a large or very large prostate. And then also, is there a median lobe comes into play? And then again, preferences on um, ejaculation and sexual function play into some of the subtleties for the small and average prostates. And then also, if you have an increased risk of bleeding, um, uh, the AOA guidelines would suggest, you know, considering either a HOLIP or um, a green light laser-based uh, therapy or a THULIP due to the decreased risk for postoperative bleeding. So these are just typical cases I might see in my office. And I put them up to have you think, just think through in your mind, what kind of things are you thinking about? I always like to look for, you know, in the middle, you can see there's severe trabeculation. This patient has a pretty impressive obstructing median lobe. The patient on the right has like a hemi median lobe. Just their right side has this big lobe of tissue. And then on the left, you don't really have any median lobe, just sort of the, kiss, the classic co-opting kissing lobes. Um, in my personal practice, I also look for the ureteral orifices while I'm in there just to get a sense of are they close or far away uh, from the prostate. Over there on the right, you can see I'm turning. I can see a UO there, and that's sort of raised up behind the prostate tissue. So for me, that's a helpful anatomically to know if I'm going to do a green light or a, a procedure that the UO is not too far away, so I want to be cautious of that. And these are, again, very helpful to show patients in this era of personalized medicine and, uh, inf and more of a you know, physician-patient interactive discussion. I think showing them illustrations, showing them trabeculations, the median lobe is a very uh, powerful tool for patients to see, to help them understand their disease process, get them more involved in understanding and wanting to participate in the management. And then, you know, really, when you have the discussion with the patient, not only in your mind thinking of the flow chart, but also what are the patient's specific goals. So uh, always important, I think we know a lot more of this than we used to, if they have storage symptoms. You know, I think I counsel everyone very aggressively now, and I say, based on the new data, you know, even if we treat your outlet obstruction, one in three men does have persistent storage symptoms, and they may end up needing a medication, particularly a, a, a beta-3 um, 
beta-3 agonist but or an anticholinergic. Um, and then obviously patient factors about whether they're a good candidate for surgery and general anesthesia, whether they're a bleeding risk, um, and then their, their preferences. So if they're dead set on absolutely not having a <laughs> catheter, then that limits the things you can offer them. Um, if you want to preserve ejaculatory function, we've heard a lot about you know, patients, especially younger ones, are very interested in preserving that. Um, maybe they want a really fast return to normal activity. Uh, or maybe they want to minimize symptoms uh, in the post-operative period. So we'll just start running through um, the procedures. So the prostatic urolift or urethral lift, um, we've all seen this, this, uh, this picture with the clips putting in. I always tell people it's like drawing open the curtains of a window. Uh, you get a nice view in there. Um, the AUA guideline, you know, recommends it as an option for prostates between 30 and 80 grams specifically with no uh, median lobe present. I've actually had insurance uh, carriers deny urolifts based on documented median lobes, so certainly that's something to be aware of. And then for patients who desire preservation of erectile function and ejaculatory function, this is one of the procedures to consider per the guidelines. Some advantages, it does have rapid relief. Uh, usually there's no need for a catheter. Um, and preserve sexual function. And this guideline is based on the LIFT study, which was a randomized controlled trial. The nice thing, a lot of these studies are, this, are similar designs where it's a uh, two-to-one randomized controlled crossover study with a sham group, and then they're offered the ability to cross over. The study excluded the median lobe, and that's partly the basis for the guideline. Um, I think some things to note from the pivotal study was that 32% of patients failed their void trial and needed a catheter. So Despite one of the hallmarks of this advantages of being not needing a catheter, I think you have to acknowledge with the patient there's still a pretty significant risk they may need one. Um, they do have a fast return to normal activity, uh, and then the IPSS improves you know, pretty rapidly, as you can see here. Uh, and then there's no new onset of sustained sexual dysfunction uh, or ejaculatory bother up to five years in this trial. Uh, just touching on some of the adverse effects, you can see there over on the lower right, um, pelvic pain, dysuria, and um, urge incontinence can be short-lived for a couple weeks after the procedure. Um, importantly, I think, uh, I always quote the, the retreatment rates. So for Urolift, it's a 14% surgical retreatment rate at five years um, with an 11% medical failure rate. And then we touched on this yesterday, but there is some data that you know, uh, the presence of the clips may create an artifact on a prostate MRI. So if you have a really anxious patient or someone with a family history of prostate cancer, you know, who you anticipate doing a lot of screening, um, it's worth mentioning that to them because uh, that may re they may not be able to have as good of a high-quality MRI if, if there's someone you're going to anticipate doing more screening. And then I think worthy of noting is that there is a study looking at using Urolift in the presence of a median lobe, um, which I put down here. It's a little bit of a limited study. It's an observational cohort, so there's no matched control. They did report improved urinary parameters, um, but because of the nature of the study not having a control group, it, it's not deemed to be high-quality evidence, and so the AOA guidelines uh, does not include it. So water vapor thermal therapy, or the resume, uh, basically the injection of steam into the prostate capsule causes ablation of the tissue. Um, the nice thing in this procedure is the steam is kept within the capsule of the prostate, unlike earlier technologies, um, where like with radio frequency, you kind of have injuries around the prostate as well. <clears throat> and so the guideline states this is a treatment option, uh, again, for prostates in the 30 to 80 gram range. And also this should be considered an option for patients who desire preservation of erectile and ejaculatory function. I do quote a 4% risk of um, retrograde ejaculation with this, uh, which I think is important to note. Personally, when patients come in demanding preservation of ejaculation, I always caution them that I can't guarantee 100%. Um, I think one nice thing about this procedure is it's, it's agnostic to the presence of a median lobe. So you can, here, here's a picture where you can see the median lobe and it's, it's been nicely uh, removed. This guideline is based on the RESUME study, uh, which is now in its sixth year. 
there's six year data, but basically almost 200 patients, um, a third of which did have a median lobe. Um, the majority of patients had a catheter for three days. They had a pretty quick return to normal activity by four days, which is essentially when the catheter comes out. <clears throat> And then you start to see an IPSS symptom improvement as early as two weeks, but really the maximum improvement that you'll see is by three to six months. Um, it, it's important to note there are some adverse events short term after this procedure. So patients um, can have dysuria, hematuria, um, urgency, and frequency are probably the main ones and hematospermia. And most of these will resolve by, by one to two months or certainly by three months. Um, and uh, importantly, the surgical retreatment rate is 4.4% at five years with an 11% need to go back on medication. And then you can see over on the right, sexual function is preserved in these patients up to at five years. Interestingly, um, you know, they did a sub-analysis of patients who had pre-existing ED. And so you can see there that the those patients also kind of stay stable at their level. Um, mention was made of this, you know, there was some concern about dysuria and irritative symptoms after the resume, and so there's a new technique called less is more that Dr. Chugtai has pioneered that essentially if you have the ability to give one treatment per lobe instead of potentially more, uh, that's usually sufficient for treating the prostate, and it comes with the benefit of less irritative symptoms after during the patient's recovery. It may take a little longer to see that early improvement in symptoms, but by the time you get to three to six months, the IPSS scores are, are consistently matched to patients from the resume study where they had more injections. And you can see in, in, his, in their data, the adverse event rate went from 44% down to 12%. So pretty impressive uh, improvement in the post-operative uh, symptoms. So moving on to uh, a temporarily implanted prostatic device, or ITIN. This is a device uh, that's a, basically a wire cage that's inserted via cystoscopy in the patient. It sits at the bladder neck and the prostatic fossa, and it basically pops open like a spring, and over five days it causes these ischemic um, incisions in the 12 o'clock, 5, and 7 o'clock positions. And so the mechanism is that you get... This wire causes this, this cut, which is a ischemic permanent uh, cut through the prostate. Uh, in the guidelines, they do they recommend considering this. It's an expert opinion, so the data is a little bit less robust, um, but considering it for patients between 25 and 75 grams and who do not have a median lobe. And there, you can see a picture from their study at 12 months. It, that, is, that cut channel at the 5 o'clock position is still is still present. The data for this is based on a study that looked at 185 patients, um, notably no median lobe. Um, the standard criteria PVR had to be less than 250, uh, Qmax was less than 12, and uh, they found a 78% improvement in IPSS. This one interests me because in the sham group they had a 60% improvement in IPSS. We talked about this yesterday a little. So take that with a grain of salt. You know, the, the actual symptom improvement, may, it, may, it may be um, not as significant if you factor in the sham group. Um, and then there is an, there's an observational cohort from this study that that's finds that this effect is durable at least to four years. But again, it's, it's a low-quality uh, paper because there's no control group on it. But this is definitely something to be aware of as it's coming out. Uh, I would highlight in talking with people who've done it, the adverse event rate is, is fairly um, notable. So 40% of patients have adverse events, but a lot of them are pelvic pain, dysuria, hematuria. And it, I think it's all related to having a wire cage inside your, uh, your prostate for five days that's probably not causing um, a, a positive feeling. Um, just to mention Optilum, because it's not in the guidelines yet, it's important to recognize that the data is young. Um, and so the, the, the guidelines has actually issued that, you know, pending more data, it may make it into the next round of guidelines. But I just want to put it up here because, it, um, you know, it's, it's up and coming. Dr. Kaplan is presenting it at the AUA. Um, they have the device out here you can look at. Essentially, it's this double balloon system um, that 
blows up and causes a anterior commissurotomy and then delivers paclitaxel to to have a sort of maintain the luminal patency and during healing. It's the same technique. They, they make a balloon that's coated for um, stricture disease. Uh, so green light PVP, so um, pretty popular. Um, essentially, you're blading the tissue, um, and then you get this thin layer underneath from the depth of penetration that causes coagulation. And um, so this one has, you know, pretty good evidence, moderate recommendation to be used for, for uh, prostates, both small, medium, or small and, uh, and medium. The data for this is based on the Goliath study we probably all remember from um, oh, a little while ago. Essentially, it was a non-inferiority study that showed it was non-inferior to TERP. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I will say um, a lot. Of, there's a lot of variability in the success rate of green light. I've heard different amounts of um, sort of retreatment rates quoted, anywhere from 5 to 25 or 30 percent. I would draw your attention to this study. Uh, a few years back from the, what's called the Global Green Light Group, which is a group of international surgeon, high volume green light surgeons. Um, and they reported a study of 3,600 patients with a mean size of 60, but the prostates ranged from 40 all the way to 120 grams. Um, and in, in their data set, the five year retreatment rate was only 1.5%. So I'm not sure this necessarily reflects the community practice urologist, because these are obviously high volume surgeons in academic centers. Um, I personally quote 10% retreatment rate at 10 years, <clears throat> which I think is probably is fair or slightly high. Um, uh, so Holip, the I don't do this, so I can't um, claim to it, but it is the only size independent procedure for BPH. Um, so you can consider it for pretty much any patient, especially patients also who are at risk for bleeding. Um, so the, um, the AOA guidelines reflect should be an option depending on clinician expertise, um, but it's a size independent option. The main pros of it is it does have one of the lowest reoperation rates, 1.4%. Uh, no, should not have any effect on erectile function. Main downsides are uh, retrograde ejaculation and then transient urinary <coughs> leakage, which can persist up to um, three to six months. This series quotes it at 3% greater than six months. But again, some of this has to do with uh, surgeon expertise. And then other, the other issue is the learning curve and the equipment. So it does take an investment of time, energy, maintenance of your training by doing more cases, and then also having the right equipment. Uh, robotic water jet treatment or aquablation, which has now been out for a couple of years. Uh, the guideline statement, this has an evidence grade C, so a little bit lower evidence than the others. Um, but they do offer it as a treatment for prostates from eight, uh, 30 to 80 grams. Um, the highlight of aquablation is that it can treat larger prostates than that. So the guideline will likely change as the new studies come out. Um, this was based on the original study, which is the water study, where they only looked at 30 to 80 gram prostates. Um, they quoted a 10% uh, an, an ejaculation rate at three years, so it, uh, it can preserve... Um, ejaculatory function, uh, and they have a 6% retreatment rate. So in their study compared to a TERP, it was actually um, slightly better than that. Uh, I will say in this early study, there is a 10%, um, I think there's a 6% bleeding transfusion rate and 10 to 15% hematuria um, complication rate. So the new study supposedly has uh, improved data for that coming out with the WATER2 study, so we'll stay tuned. So um, just to summarize all this real quickly, I think, you know, it's really important when I counsel patients or when you think about BPH patients, really review the data with them, I think is very helpful. That show, talk about their bladder health, their prostate size, their anatomy. If you do a cystoscopy and you have the ability to, for them to participate, one, it's less painful if they're watching when it happens, and two, I think they get more involved in their care. Uh, I, I think a Euroflow is a great tool to get an objective data point. <clears throat> And then really in 2024, it's about shared decision making. So um, that's kind of my little default quote. I always, my cheesy statement, I tell people that like, look, we're going to, we're watching all this and talking through it because I want to make sure you, you know, are satisfied and understand what you're going to be getting out of this procedure because expectation, managing expectations, I think is half the battle here and anticipating the recovery pathways. 
So this is just my rough cheat sheet. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, but these are kind of the things I think about. And if, if a patient has a strong desire for one of these categories, it tends to make me think towards uh, one of these procedures. So if you want a quick, quick return to normal activities, then some of the mists are the way to go. Uh, if you want to preserve ejaculation, also the mists, you know, the resume, the urolift, itin, uh, large median lobes, um, certainly the, the laser therapies or the TERP. Um, Avoiding post-operative LUTs, I would say the you know the the resume potentially with the one injection technique, um, and then obviously multiple comorbidities or wanting to avoid general anesthesia, especially in these sick sicker patients or elderly patients, then one of the procedures that you can do without having to to use general anesthesia is a big win. Thank you very much. <laughs>